I want you to take your copy of God's Word, and I want you to open it, the Old Testament, go back to the book of Jonah, that real, real, real clean place back there in the back of your Old Testament as you start into uh, these minor prophets. They're not minor because they were of less importance. Uh, It's the length of their writing that's called, that gives them the title of minor prophets. Let me tell you, years ago, when our daughter hit 14 or 15, we made a decision for our family. You know, we give our kids all the experiences they can have in life. You know, we gave them, we went through everything from uh, uh, piano to, um, what's that thing that Kenny G plays? Saxophone to violin to all of that and broke their mother's heart. None of them did anything with music. And uh, we gave, they all played sports, wrestled, football, uh, uh, softball. Courtney was on the high school softball team. All the boys, the, the boys, all their stuff. We decided with all the things that we were going to give them the experience, that we were going to give them the experience of going to the mission field. And so we took each one of them individually, and then we took them multiple times as a family to the mission field. The best money the Brunson family ever spent was spent on taking our kids on an international short-term mission trip. In fact, God called our daughter. I had her in the Middle East, and uh, she told me it was there in the Middle East that God called her, and he called her to the Middle East uh, for several years. So I want you to take your copy of God's Word. Be open to what God's going to say to you this morning and all week this week leading up to next Sunday morning. Now, I know you've been in life groups studying the book of Jonah, And if you're not in a life group, let me tell you, that's the most important thing I can tell you to do at this church. Get in a life group. Far more important than you're even being in worship is you're being in a life group. That's where you're going to make connection. That's where you're going to build friendship. That's where you're going to study the Bible. Verse by verse, that's where you're going to get doctrine. That's where you're going to get cared for in those life groups. You've been going through this, so I'm going to take you back to the book of Jonah. And you say, well, we've just gone through it. Well, you know, I'm going to take you. I don't know that I'm going to teach you anything new, as Elizabeth Taylor said on her eighth honeymoon. I don't know that I'm going to teach you anything new, but I'm going to take you back and I'm going to show you something in the Word of God this morning. Jonah uh, chapter 1. Now listen to me, and I want you to get this because this is the whole of the book of Jonah. Our decision to respond to God's call or not to respond to God's call, will not determine the outcome of God's will. Our decision to respond or not respond to God's call will not determine the outcome of God's will. In other words, God doesn't need us. We desperately need Him. So now, look... To this simple outline, as you open Jonah chapter 1, there's a great call, and there's a great call on all of our lives, and you see that in the opening verse and the opening few words, the word of the Lord came. Now, that you find over 90 times in the Old Testament. The word of the Lord came to David. The word of the Lord came to Abraham. The word of the Lord came to Solomon. The word of the Lord came to Jehu. The word of the Lord came to Isaiah. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel. The word of the Lord came to Habakkuk. The word of the Lord came to Zephaniah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. And in fact, you can write your name in right there. If you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you can put your name right there. The word of the Lord came to Bob. The word of the Lord came to Joe. The word of the Lord came to Mary. The word of the Lord came to whoever you are. If you're saved, the word of the Lord comes to you. And it's not a word of salvation. In fact, let me me do this. If you put your finger there in Jonah and you look over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, listen to what Paul says in verse 9. God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. He calls us, we're saved, but when you come to this expression in the Old Testament, the word of the Lord came to whoever, what you come to here is you come to a specific task. 
This is not the call to salvation. This is called to a, spe- to a specific task. And you need to understand this. Every Christian, every believer is called to a special task. We're not all called to the same task, but we are all called to a specific task. That is, God will call us and he will give us a personal task that he desires for us to fulfill. Now, let me, let me just stop and explain something to you because I have a lot of people who say to me and have said to me over the years, they will say, you know what? I have always wanted God to use me. I've always wanted God to give me some task, some something to do. I've always waited for God. Now, I have two questions. I don't say this to them, but I'm saying it to you in a sermon because you may be sitting there thinking the same thing. Well, I've always wanted God to come. I've always wanted to be used of God. I've always wanted. Well, listen, number one, you're either not listening because he does, regardless of who you are, or you have told him no. And you can tell God's no so many times that God will essentially just stop calling you to service. Now, you can do that. You're either telling him no, or you're either not listening to God. A lot of times, the reason we tell God no is that, well, that's just not my area of giftedness. That's just not really, well, then my follow-up is, why don't you tell me what your area of giftedness is? Uh, that's just not what I'm gifted to do. That's just not what I'm, I'm called. I don't believe that that's in the area of my talent or my ability. Let me, let, me, let me let you in on something. Sharing Jesus Christ doesn't come down to do you have the talent or giftedness to share Jesus Christ. When God calls you to share his word, he's not looking for your level of talent and ability. He's looking for your level of obedience. Anybody can share what's happened to them. Anybody can tell you what they've experienced in life. That's not a giftedness. That's not a talent. That is simply bearing witness to what happened in your life. Well, all of us, in that sense, we've got that. Uh, We've got that call on our lives to a specific task. Now it comes to Jonah. Watch in the text. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. By the way, do you know what his name means? Tell the truth. His name is tell the truth. Can you imagine every time Jonah called daddy, he would holler out, tell the truth. Are you here? Tell the truth. And uh, Jonah's name is Dove. So every time his daddy called him, Dove, you know, come home. Arise. Do you see that? Verse 2. That's a word that was given to Abraham as well. If you're with us on Wednesday nights, we just started there. Arise. He says that to David, arise. He says that, um, you come to the New Testament, listen, he says that to Peter, he says that to Paul, he says that to Ananias, he says it to the deacon Philip in the book of Acts, arise, get up. Now look at what he says, go, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Now, Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, which was... If you want to know the truth, it was, it was the evil empire. This was the home of Darth Vader, if there ever was a home for Darth Vader. These Assyrians were brutal. They were not just mean. They were perhaps the cruelest people ever to exist in human history. I'm not going to begin to tell you all the things that they did, but their cruelty was legendary in the ancient world. It, they did what ISIS, it makes what ISIS has done look like a bunch of high school uh, choir boys and, and what they would do as compared to what these Assyrians would do. And that's what God calls him to do. And what he's saying is this, you perform the priestly function of the Hebrew nation. Now understand this and remember this because I'm going to come back to it in just a moment. Uh, God called Abraham out of the Ur of the Chaldees, and he is called a Hebrew for the first time. It's either in in Genesis 13, 14, or 14, 13. I can never remember that. He's called a Hebrew for the first time. God has pulled Abraham out in his family, and out of Abraham, he's going to make an entire nation of people for one purpose. 
And the one purpose of those people is to take the word of God to the rest of the world. Do you remember what God says in Genesis chapter 12 in the Abrahamic covenant to Abraham? He says, through you, all the families of the world, of the earth, will be blessed. Through you, all the nations of the world. Through you, all the ethnos, everybody will be blessed. And so he comes to Jonah and he says, Jonah, you're a Hebrew. I have set aside the Hebrew people to serve me as priests in all the earth. I have deposited my word into the Hebrew people, into the Hebrew nation. And he says, I want you to take that word and go now to these Assyrians in Nineveh, and I want you to preach to them that if they don't turn and repent, I'm going to destroy them in 40 days. Now, that was his call. It was a priestly call. It is exactly what God had called the nation to do. Now, watch this. Verse 3, but Jonah. You're going to notice down in verse 4, if you've got a King James, it's going to say, but the Lord. In verse 3, it says, but Jonah. It's kind of an interesting play here on these two. But Jonah rose up not to pray, not to go, not to talk to the Lord about it. He says nothing to God, but Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish. Now, we don't really know uh, where Tarshish was, but there are scholars who believe that it was Tartessus, which is at the very end. If you look at the map of Spain, uh, you see off on the Mediterranean side, you've got the little piece that juts out that's Gibraltar. On the other side, you've got a little piece that juts out toward the west, that is Tartessus. It was a mining city. Uh, they would mine metals there. It was literally the end of the world. They had no idea that there was anything across that wide ocean. Nobody had ever been that far or, or been that way. And so they believed that this place was absolutely the end of the world, kind of like Amarillo, Texas. It is absolutely the end of the world. That's as far away as he could go. And by the way, let me show you what happens when a man attempts to move away from God, it is always in the same direction, down. If you look at this, I'll just point it out in verse 3. He goes down to Joppa. At the end of verse 3, he goes down into the hole of the ship. In verse 5, we're told that he goes down and he falls asleep. Uh, now, if you look over in verse 12, it says, throw me into, which is down into the sea. In verse 15, it says that they threw him into the sea. That is down into the sea. Chapter 2, it speaks about the depth of Sheol. That's down. Verse 3, you cast me into the deep. That's down. At the end of verse 3 in chapter 2, you passed over me. That means I am under. I'm down. Do you, do you, get, the, you get the point, don't you? The, whole, the Holy Spirit is driving this whole thing down, 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 you're going to get that and see that in chapter 2 next week. He gets as far down as you can possibly go. So he goes to Joppa. Now, I've had a lot of people over the last couple of weeks ask me, why did Jonah run from God? In fact, I think Jeff McGookin even asked me the other day. He says, why do you think Jonah did this? I have only one thing that I can give to you. He was a racist. <laughs> there, you know, that, that term is so used today, we don't even pay it attention anymore. But I'm going to tell you, Jonah was a pure racist. Do you know why? Because he didn't want God to save anybody but the Jews. He hated everything. And listen, let me tell you, in that day and into the New Testament, you were either Jew or you were whatever you were. It didn't matter what your color was. It didn't matter what your culture was. It didn't matter what your background was. If you were not Jew, you were, you were Gentile. And they had no divisions for the Gentiles. Gentiles were just all, you know what they believed about Gentiles? That we were made to fuel the fires of hell, like a cord of wood, that God would just throw us on the fire of hell to keep it burning. Well, that's what they thought. Jonah did not want to do it. He didn't want to go to these Assyrians. They were brutal. They were cruel. They were wicked people. They were pagan people. They were not like me. I'm a son of Abraham. I am not interested in God. If you get to the fourth chapter, I've given you the end of the book. He gets to the end of the book, and Jonah, you want to know why Jonah didn't go? Jonah said, he, he says this to God, I knew you were a merciful God. I knew you would save those wicked people, and I didn't want them saved. 
So I don't know anything else to call him but a pure T racist here. He was not interested. He hated everybody who was not a Jew. I don't think he was afraid. If you go back to 2 Kings chapter 14, he goes, the Bible just gives a brief mention that Jonah goes and he speaks to Jeroboam II, who was a wicked king, and in the middle of the wickedness of the king of Israel, God was blessing Israel. Boy, I could make so many political analogies, and y'all would just say I'm just making political analogies. But even in the midst of a wicked time, God was blessing Israel because God was saying in his blessing, come to me. I'm the one who's blessing you. I'm the one who's doing it. It's not Congress. It's not the president. It's not the Supreme Court. It's God. If there is a blessing in your life today, I can promise you it is from God, not the state. That's where jo And Jonah went to Jeroboam, and the Bible says he spoke the word of God to him. I am imagining that what he said was, you are wicked, and you need to turn to God, and the only reason this land is being blessed is because of God, not because of you. Okay, y'all all right? I, okay, I, all right, good. So, I don't think he's afraid. I don't think he's scared. He stood face to face with Jeroboam II and gave him the word of God. I don't think going to Nineveh was a frightening thing to him. I don't think he wanted to do it. I don't think he wanted to do it because I can't imagine that God would have given him any other task that Jonah would not have done it. But when God said, go and preach to these Gentile people in Nineveh, Jonah just simply decided in his mind, not going to happen. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to the evil empire. So what does he do? Look at the text. Verse 3, he goes down to Joppa, and he found a ship. Now, does the, does the place Joppa ring a bell in your mind? Yes, pastor. Yes, yes. Joppa was the only seaport at that time. It was the only seaport that Israel had on the Mediterranean. Now, you get to the New Testament, Herod will have built a great seaport called Caesarea Maritima. It's an incredible place. But at this time, Joppa was the only place. And uh, if uh, you fly into Israel, and just as your plane is about to land, you look on the coast because you fly in off the Mediterranean, right to the right of the plane, if you're on the right side of the plane, you look down, you'll see the ancient seaport city of Joppa right there. It's right there. And so that's where he goes. He goes to Joppa. Now, I ask you, did that ring a bell? And it should because Peter goes to Joppa. In the book of Acts, chapter 9. And he's staying at the home of a guy by the name of Simon the Tanner. And you remember, he goes up on the roof one day, and as he goes up on the roof of the house, He's really hungry, and he has a vision of this great cloth coming down. I imagine it was like a tablecloth, a great cloth coming down that had all of these animals on it, and, and a voice out of heaven speaks the greatest verse in the New Testament, arise, kill, and eat. And Peter says, Lord, I don't eat this stuff. And you remember the whole story, and the story is this. Don't call unclean what I call clean. And what God was doing, he was setting Peter up for a group of men that were coming from the house of Cornelius. Cornelius was a centurion who lived in Caesarea Maritima. He was the centurion over a cohort of Italians. In other words, Cornelius was a Roman's Roman. He was Roman from Italy overseeing Roman troops which was a little unusual because they conscripted other people to do a lot of their fighting. He was a Roman's Roman, and yet he was a man who was hungry to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so God tells Cornelius, you send a couple of men up here, go to this house where Simon the Tanner is, you ask for Peter and tell Peter to come down here, and God's preparing Peter's heart at the same time. Do you all see all this preparation going on? Okay, I want you just to be sure you're following with me and tracking with me. 
They come and knock on the door. Peter goes to the door. They say, listen, we need for you to come up here. And by the way, Joppa is just to the south of, uh, of Caesarea. He had maybe 20 miles along the coast to walk up to Caesarea. He walks up to Caesarea, knocks on the door at Cornelius' house, looks at him, and listen to what he says. He says, I, being a Jew, I can't come into a Gentile house. I can't come into your house but he does, and he preaches the gospel. And Cornelius and his wife and his children and all of the servants there and any of the other Roman guards that might have been there, all of the whole place came to Jesus Christ that day. Now, listen, are you, are you tracking with me? Now, hold on. You have got Jonah who flees and goes to, to Joppa to escape having to go to the hated Gentiles to share with them the gospel. And in Acts, you have got Peter who goes to the hated Gentile, a Roman centurion, no doubt, to share the gospel. And he does, and they come to Christ. In the Old Testament with the Jews, they had rejected and rejected and rejected what God had called them and birthed them and um, elected them to do to the point to where they even put God's Messiah on a cross and God says, that's it now. I've called you to be my people, but I'm going to turn now and I'm going to get somebody else to take the gospel. Since the Jew will not take the gospel, I'm going to send somebody else to the nations, to people unlike us, to cultures unlike us, to people with different language than us, to people who eat different things than us, who look differently than us. Who did God give the priestly function of taking the gospel to the ends of the earth when the Jews said, no, thank you, we won't do it? Who did he give it to? Us, us. We have been called of God. You say, but I'm not an ordained preacher. Are you saved to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Then you have been given the task to take the gospel as far and as wide as you can take it. The Jews said no. Let me tell you something. Our responding or not responding to the call of God will not determine the completion of the will of God. God will get it done. Now, you listen to me, Valleydale. I was in a store yesterday. My wife had on Run the Race shirt, and this guy standing in line said, what's, what's the, run to race, win the run, to, run to Win the Race movie? What, what, is, what is that? And she began to tell him, uh, what the movie was about. She did not tell him that her son was the executive producer of it, but she did tell him about the movie. And he looked at us and he said, well, where do y'all fellowship? And I said, we fellowship at Valleydale. And he said, oh, I have heard such wonderful things about that church. There's a word going on about this church that's out there. We have a season right now you mark it down. You hear me now or you'll hear it later. I want to tell you something. You mark it down. We have a season right now where the Spirit of God is on this church, and if we don't seize this opportunity, he doesn't need Valleydale. He can go find somebody else to do what he wants to do in Hoover and in Birmingham. Do we hear that? You say, well, that's pretty strong preaching, son. I ain't got started yet. This is the introduction. I'm telling you. We cannot say no to God. We can say no. That's not going to stop the will of God. But we will miss being the blessing. And we will miss the blessing if we say no. Now, I don't even see a time clock back there today. So I have unlimited time. <laughs> let, me, let me give you the second thing. And the second thing is this. I bet they'll get it up fast. You wait. <laughs> Let me, let me give you the second thing. Listen, there's a great call. God's got a call on your life. I don't care who you are. If you name the name of Jesus Christ, God's got a call on your life. Here's the great storm. This is the part of Jonah. Do you know this is why you know Jonah? 
I was just telling my wife this. Tell me something. Somebody quick, stand up and tell me something about Obadiah. Nahum? Habakkuk. You all know the story of Jonah, don't you? You know why? It's all narrative. The whole thing is narrative. It's a story. Listen, it's a story, but the book of Jonah is a story about the story of Jonah. And you all know a story, and we all know the story of Jonah. He gets on that ship, but the Lord. Do you see that in verse 4? Now, here's a great thought that I don't have time to, to tease out. Can the Lord send a storm into your life to get you where he wants you to be? <laughs> Spoken like people who've experienced it. Yes. Yes. See also Mac Brunson at Valleydale Church. The Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea. Let me tell you what the rabbis say about this. Now, I've gone away from my notes. I'm just going to preach now. Uh, let me tell you what the rabbis say. The rabbis write in the Talmud about this, and they say that the reason this thing was so frightening to these sailors was that they were still not far from port, and the storm was just over their ship that they could see other ships sailing on calm seas, but that as they moved through the sea, that the storm hovered right over them. And it was a vicious storm to frighten. Now, that's just what the rabbis, that's not in the Bible. That's an interesting thought. But this is some more frightening storm. And the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God. Now, remember that. They began to call out in prayer to their gods. They threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Uh, but Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, laying down, and had fallen asleep. Now, here it is. Here it is. If that's not a picture of the church today, I'll shut my mouth. In the moment when this world is in the greatest crisis we've experienced in our generation, where's the church? Asleep. Asleep. I'm probably making somebody mad. I do that quite often when I preach now. <laughs> Asleep, down in the hold of the ship. So the captain, verse 6, approached him and said, How is it that you're sleeping? Here is a pagan who approaches the prophet of God and says, How can you sleep when we are in desperate situation? Get up. Call on your God. He had no idea who Jonah was. He had no idea who Jonah's God was. He just said, get up and call on your God. Now watch this. Watch this. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. Now let me ask you something. Does any of this remind you of anything else? Is there another time when a group of sailors are in a boat, in a storm, and there's some guy asleep, and they go to him, and they ask him, do you not care about us? It's called Mark chapter 4. Now listen, that's the word, that's the question the whole world asks. The whole world wants to know, is there a God out there somewhere who cares about us? I saw a tweet this week from Mia Farah that I could not believe when I read it. And so I went back and I looked it back up. She was, she dated Peter Sellers, you know, the guy that played Pink Panther. Uh, she dated him for a while. She dated, well, she married to Frank Sinatra. She married to Frank Sinatra. Then, I even hate to mention his name, Woody Allen, all of this. You know what she tweeted this week? She said, if you have a prayer to spare, Please pray, I have a loved one in crisis. Now, that woman, as far as I know, she was very much into Eastern mysticism, very much into yoga, very much into all of these Hindu gods. She was wrapped up with the Beatles when they got into the Maharishi, Maharishi all that mess. She was born a Catholic. She was very new age, and yet she cries out as a pagan, if anybody has got a God that cares for us, please pray. That's the whole world. That's from Hollywood to Bollywood. It's from Los Angeles all the way to Senegal. People are crying out, is there a God that cares for us? You look at all the gods of the world, Allah, 
Nowhere in the Quran, and I've read the Quran, nowhere in the Quran where you, where you read, Allah cares and has compassion on people. He does not. You say that to an imam, an imam will be insulted. He would say that's almost blasphemous to think that Allah would have any kind of feelings toward a man. You look at Shiva. Shiva, who is called the destroyer of the earth. You guess she has any concern for man? Kali. You look at Kali. Kali is called the ferocious divine mother. She consumes her young. Look at Buddha, the pacifist Buddha. Buddha said, no one can save you but yourself. Well, he couldn't save himself. He sure can't save you. Is there a God out there that cares for man? You remember your Greek mythology? Um, Who was the guy that stole fire? I had to run back to my name. It begins with a P. Uh, Prometheus. There's somebody who studied. Prometheus. Do you remember Prometheus went down to Vulcan and he stole fire from the gods? And he brought fire back because the gods wouldn't give fire to man. And he goes down and he steals fire so that man can have light so that man can have warmth, so that man can have a steak that's cooked. You know, he can cook his food. And he brings that back, and the gods get furious with Prometheus, and they tie him to a rock, and they have a giant eagle come down and eat his liver out every day. Every night after, he grows a liver back so that he goes through the same torture every day. Those were the Greek gods. Those were the Roman gods. Those were the gods of the ancient Let me tell you something. Is there a God anywhere that cares about man? Now sit back and listen to me for just a minute. We think it was in the year 1900. At least that's how she shares the story. That a young 15-year-old African-American girl was raped. She didn't go and have one of those back alley abortions She had the child, but because of her youth and because you're living in the 1900s, there was nothing to do but let her mother, the child's grandmother, raise the little girl. And the grandmother took the little girl, and she reared the little girl as best she could. But the grandmother died when the little girl was 13. Her mother gets her back, and because she still cannot care, her mother is in a mess herself. She gives her to an older man as a wife at 13 years of age. The man did nothing but abuse the little girl, did nothing but hurt her, abuse her physically until she had had enough and she said, I'm going to get out of this, and she runs away. Now, the little girl had discovered that she could sing and that she could act, and she finds her way somehow into vaudeville, and she begins to travel with vaudeville just a little bit, but she's not making anything She's discovered now that all the people over vaudeville are cheating her out of, out of the money that she needs just to sustain life. And so she leaves that and she goes to the circus and she begins to travel now on boxcars from town to town to town. This little girl from town to town to town looking for enough food to eat and enough money to sustain life. In the midst of all that, somebody picks up on this girl can sing and she can act. To make a long story short, this young African-American girl becomes one of the great jazz singers of the 30s. In fact, she has 50, 50 hits. Summertime. um, Oh, you know all those songs. In fact, she became the first African-American to ever appear on Broadway. She became, in 1939, the first African-American to ever have a television show, 15 minutes a week. But her show preceded Nat King Coles, who is normally looked at as having the first, uh, being the first African-American on TV. She had the first television show. She sang with Tommy Dorsey. She sang with Benny Goodman. She sang with Count Basie. She sang with Duke Ellington. She sang with all these groups. She was extremely well-known. Very successful. Never got beyond the fact that she was the product of a rape. 
never felt like she was ever loved, ever wanted, ever cared for, and everybody that ever met her, white or black, reinforced that feeling in her life. She's here in Alabama on a trip and has a wreck. They pick up a young black lady, put her on a gurney, and take her to a mental institute where the doctors and nurses come around her gurney and just decide, well, she's black, she's uh, too far gone, just leave her here. And they walk off and leave her on a gurney in a mental institute. But one nurse notices her and recognizes her and goes to her and does what she can do for her and in fact gets her up gets her into a cab, takes her to the train station, puts her on a train, and gets her back to her home where this young lady just retreated behind her doors and behind her own heart where she hated everybody who was anybody. She hated white people. She hated black people until she came to the place where she hated herself. You hate long enough, you'll eventually hate the last person There he is. You'll begin to hate yourself. Into her life walked Billy Graham and told her that God loved her and cared not one whit about her color or her past or her lifestyle. And Billy Graham said, I don't care what color you are. And Ethel Waters came to Christ. And for the rest of her life, sang a song, even though she sang hits like Summertime and Stormy Weather and recorded so many hits, Ethel Waters sang one song that expressed the fact that God cares for everybody. And you know what the song is. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. There's one God, folks, that cares for people. Only one, only one, and his name is Jesus. And we have been tasked to take the name of a God who cares to the rest of the world. I got one more point, but I'm going to give the invitation right here. You read the rest of that chapter, you see the pagan sailors get saved. They turn from their gods. Listen, they make vows. They turn from their gods and they begin to sacrifice to the God, to the God of Jonah. Watch this. They take Jonah, they take a Jew, they take a Jew and they sacrifice his life so that the lie of everyone else can be saved. Ooh, ooh, does that sound like anything in the New Testament to you? They take a Jew and they sacrifice his life so that they can now have relationship with a God who cares for them. Let's stand.